And starting, and I'm muting. Perfect. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants Hangout. My name is Joe Gorowski, and I will be your host for today, along with Sarah Provado, who will be joining us. I'm going to do the little intro today, and then Sarah is going to take over and rock a Q&A for us. Now, before we meet today's guest, we're going to be hanging out with Tara Keir from National Geographic. I just want to remind everybody what we've been up to this month. So this month, we've been celebrating amazing women in science and exploration, adventure and conservation. We posted a whole bunch of events and had a lot of fun, and we still have a ton more uh, coming up between now and the end of the month. So check out the website uh, and see if there's some camera spots left and join in with your classrooms. Now, as I mentioned, we're really excited to be joined by Tara today. Tara is a geographer and a photojournalist, and she's planning to capture the current media narrative representing uh, the rhino poaching crisis as a war on poaching with a war on poachers. Now, Tara, uh, it's very exciting. So make sure you guys give a big shout out to her. A big congratulations. She is a 2019 grantee with National Geographic. So we can officially call her a National Geographic Explorer, which is really exciting. So Tara, you've been on adventures all around the world before. You've got a really big one coming up now. We're so excited to have you joining in and hanging out with us today. I'm really excited to be here. <laughs> Um, yeah, when Joe first asked me to do this, you know, I I started thinking, okay, how can I how can I give a talk to you guys who are what you know from nine to you know how many twelve years old or something like that? And I started thinking what I was doing when I was that age, and I knew that I was someone who loved elephants, loved wildlife, but had no clue how that would end up impacting my job at all. And so before I start talking to you guys, I want to let you know, I kind of have this dual identity going on at the moment. Um, who you see here in this blazer, you know, with my work badge is the Tara Keir who works for the expeditions team at National Geographic. Um, and I started here four years ago um, on this amazing adventure. But now is the kind of new identity that's really the passion driven side of Tara um, that's just gotten this National Geographic grant. I'm officially a part of the Explorer family that Joe's a part of. And, um, and so I'm gonna touch on that too, but I thought for you guys, it could be really interesting to hear the crazy journey I went on to get to this point where I've been able to have these awesome adventures. Um, so yeah, when I was your age, uh, I loved elephants, I was not thinking much about my future when it, in terms of, you know, a career in geography or a career as a photographer or something crazy like that. I was just getting through day to day. Um, but it wasn't until I went to college that I started to actually have to think, okay, what's my path going to be? And back then I actually thought I was going to be a teacher. And my uh, freshman year of college, I kind of panicked because I was undecided on my major. And so I decided I was going to become this teacher. That was my declaration of my major. I was gonna be an educator. And then I got the paperwork for what classes I had to take in order to be a teacher. And I remember I must've had this look of um, disappointment on my face because none of those classes seemed to be something I was interested in. And then I started thinking, well, what am I doing right now that I love? And I was taking a geography class at the time called Geography of the Developing World. And it was opening my eyes to the fact that geography was way more than just maps and memorizing capitals and uh, you know where places were on a map. It was a way to think about the world spatially and you could apply it to anything. And that's when I realized, wow, I can pair this love for wildlife with this love of geography. And I ended up doing my senior thesis on elephant conservation biogeography, which is basically studying where elephants are and the interactions they're having with humans. So that was the first turning point is when I became that geography major. That kind of set me down this path, uh, which also gave me the opportunity to apply for an internship with National Geographic. And miraculously, after hard work, I ended up getting it. And once I got to National Geographic, um, Another another point in my life happened that really changed the game for me. And it was my first day at my internship. And I was about to start being a researcher for this one team at National Geographic. And they didn't have work for me to do yet on the first day. So um, instead, they told me I could take a look at our W drive and see all the work they'd been doing. So me being me, I sit there and search elephants. And uh, I came across this raw cut video footage 
from a series called Battle for the Elephants. And I was hit like, almost like I hit a brick wall. I was this girl who loved elephants, but I had no idea about the poaching crisis. And that's what this whole like film that I was watching was about. And I'm not sure uh, how familiar you all are with the poaching crisis right now in Africa, but what's happening is elephants and rhinos are being killed every day uh, for their ivory tusks or for their horn um, in the case of rhinos. And they're being sold on the black market and bought by people in communities where that commodity, which you know the horn or the ivory is seen as a status symbol or is is thought to have had uh, some medicinal value when science has never been able to prove that they've actually been able to prove that false. So what's happening is a lot of a lot of rhino and a lot of elephants are dying. And that day I realized I could no longer be this girl who loved elephants and loved wildlife, but didn't actually understand what was this biggest threat that was facing them and you know driving them towards extinction. So I set all my Google alerts for wildlife crime, illegal wildlife trafficking, ivory trade, rhino horn. And from that day forward, I found this like passion behind, you know, that love of wildlife had become like a mission I had. And that's the first time I heard about National Geographic's grant program as well during that internship. And I knew they had a program where young explorers could apply for a grant while they were but while they were between the ages of 18 and 25 and i told myself when i was 22 years old i said you've got 3 years tara you're going to write a grant proposal it's going to be about wildlife crime you don't know exactly what the story is yet but that's the first time i told myself you're going to do this and it's crazy now that it's you know what 4 years later and that's happened um but before I go down that path of how I got that grant. Um, there's a lot of things about the job I have on the expeditions team that has led me to the grant process as well. And I think it'll be a fun adventure to take you on kind of like because of these great adventures I've gone on with this actual team at National Geographic. So my day job for you guys to understand, I'm on a team called expeditions. And what we do is we work with our explorers all over the world to put trips together that people can go on and be alongside an explorer learning about that place, uh, like in, in those locations where that explorer has done work. So for my job, I've had this amazing opportunity to travel because we need to do inspections and we need to make sure the trips are gonna run well and interact with our experts out in the field. So I'm gonna have you stop looking at my face at this point and um, get you to see some interesting photos. So I'm gonna share my screen right now. Um, so you can have something more fun to look at than me. Let me get this presentation up. So my job has taken me to crazy places. This is one of my most recent places I've been, which is Patagonia. And I was there for an inspection. Um, and I'm sure I have tons and tons of stories about these photos. And if you guys in the questions part have any any desire to hear about them, please let me know, but I'm not gonna spend too much time on, on each of these photos. But this is in Torres del Paine National Park, which is in, um, in the southern part of Chile. And um, we hiked you know, 21.5 kilometers uh, all the way up to this base of the Three Towers, which is one of probably the most epic hikes I've done in my life. Um, we also went to a place called El, um, El Chalten, which had uh, this amazing view from Mirador de los Condores. So you can see this condor flying high up in the sky. This is me in front of this Lago Sucio, which in Spanish means uh, dirty lake. And you can probably see from the photo, it's anything but dirty. This is like beautiful, pristine, the bluest glacial water I've ever seen in my life. Um, we also saw the Perito Moreno Glacier, where people actually trek across that ice. And this glacier itself is the size of an entire city, like the city of Buenos Aires. I don't know if you're familiar with it. It's in, uh, it's in Argentina, very close to where the glacier is. Um, and that's how large this massive piece of ice is. Um, but more importantly than this trip, uh, well, I, I'll cover one more trip as well. Um, Another place that work has brought me is the Galapagos Islands. Um, probably one of the coolest places to go for any wildlife lover because you just get so 
so close to wildlife, like this albatross here um, with a wingspan of over 12 feet. Um, I had an amazing time, you know, really honing in on my photography skills on those trips because I needed to be taking photographs for my job to be able to use in our materials. Um, got to spend time with the Galapagos giant tortoises and hear about their amazing conservation story on the island of Santa Cruz. And got to spend a lot of time in the water with amazing charismatic sea lions, you know, swimming right up to my camera and just doing a flip blowing bubbles in my face. Um, pretty amazing stuff. But what was the most influential trip I'd been on for my job was when work took me to Africa. And I fell in love with a place I already knew I loved. Uh, this is a picture of me in Lake Manyara National Park which is the first place I ever saw African elephants in the wild ever. And yes, it was a teary moment for me. I was just overwhelmed with just how incredible these creatures are in person. And I, you know, again, was taking photographs for work um, for us to be able to use in materials. But also this, you know, I just found this overwhelming desire that I needed to come back. You know, I fell in love with hyenas. You know, hyenas get a bad rep. We think of them as, you know, these cackling, uh, you know, problem causers in, in the Serengeti. But in reality, they're just so charming. And one of the sounds I've come to love and miss the most from Africa is the sound of a hyena at night. And, you know, they actually don't laugh as much as you think, but they make this crazy noise and imagine being in a tent in the Serengeti and hearing this sound going, ooh, ooh, as it passes your tent. And it's actually a hyena calling out to the rest of its pack um, right by your tent. And oh, it's just this uh, eerie, amazing feeling. Um, so safe to say I fell in love with Africa, African wild dogs, everything that Africa had to, had to show me. And I made a promise to myself that I was going to try to get back to Africa every year since then. And crazily enough, I've actually been able to do that um, with some good fortune. But this photo right here is the first time I saw a rhino in the wild. First time I had been that close uh, to a rhino at all in my life, let alone one in the wild. But what this next photo shows is one, I realized the power of a photo and also the power of a moment. Because all of these safari vehicles were, I took this photo right here. And I looked around and these were basically all the cars that were in this crater, this Ngorongoro crater conservation area. And they had all come to see this rhino. And it was silent. And when I looked around and saw all these cars, I realized that every person in those vehicles was having their own personal connection with that rhino. And it was so magical to see people seeing the value of a, of a wild rhino alive rather than dead with its horn on the black market. And it was just a very, very powerful moment to me because working in the field of wildlife crime, you see that destruction of beautiful species every day. And it was amazing to see, you know, the connection people can build with wildlife and how that might last throughout their lives. It certainly did for me. So I planned a trip to go back to Africa. I promised myself I would. And my boss was great and was, was, generous enough to let me take all my vacation time at once, so basically a full month, and go back to Africa, this time to South Africa. And I had a very different experience. It was not this magical wildlife experience. I had planned a trip to be a preliminary research trip for my grant. I knew I wanted to focus on the rhino poaching crisis in South Africa, and so I planned a trip you know, I felt kind of like a crazy person because I'd never been. I was going to be going by myself. I had no experience whatsoever doing any sort of investigative journalism at all. But I knew I had the passion behind it to get it done and um, to get that research done. So I knew exactly what story I wanted to tell in my grant. And so this photo right here, um, I'm sure you guys might be able to guess. Uh, these are all skulls of poached rhino that I saw on my first day in South Africa at the first anti-poaching unit that I visited.
So an anti-poaching unit is a group of men or women who uh, their their day-to-day -day job is protecting wildlife, um, and they are so so dedicated to this to to the landscape they live on and the wildlife they're protecting. And so these are just some photos of some of the time I spent with this group. Here was Pro Track Anti Poaching Rhino Task Force in South Africa, um, where we're tracking, we're looking for what they call spore here, which are tracks of not just wildlife, so rhinos around a water hole, but also the, the spore of um, potential poachers. So they're looking for all kinds of signs, not just where the wildlife is, but also if there's any traces of humans that have come through. Um, this is Tabani, he's one of the first anti-poaching unit guys that I met there, and you know, I was, like I said, a bit terrified. I had never done this before. I had never sat down and really interviewed anyone, let alone talking about a topic that's so uh, heavy. You know, we're talking about the killing of wildlife, which, you know, that's a difficult subject to navigate to begin with. And, um, but as soon as I picked up my camera and as soon as I started interviewing, it just clicked. You know, it felt like it was something, it was the confirmation I needed that this was what I was meant to be doing. I spent time with Josh. I spent time with Gareth. You know, these guys are out in the bush, so in the middle of the the in the middle of the wild in Africa, you know, protecting wildlife in these um, amazing conditions where they're just alongside wildlife all the time. And you can really that re it really just radiates from them how much they feel connected to that environment and love it. Um, I got introduced to snare poaching. All of these coils you can see are, are wire snares that are used to trap uh, wildlife so that people can collect their meat and sell it illegally. Um, I had to put an elephant photo in here because this was the one real experience I had with wildlife in my face on this trip um, on a night patrol with these guys. Um, I also visited the Black Mambas, which is an entirely different type of anti-poaching unit. So when I went on this trip, I knew there were a lot of different stories to hear. So I picked anti-poaching units that were really, really different from one another. So I could get the whole range of the story because I needed to know, you know, how are these individuals interacting with their with the situation on the ground before I can come back and and figure out what story they want to be told what story we're missing here. And so these are three women who are part of the Black Mambas in the same area in South Africa. Um, and they actually work with the guys from ProTrack. And what their job is, is to be community leaders. And also they patrol these, uh, these reserves. But what they're doing is um, actually being a deterrent. They're not carrying weapons at all. They're having a presence on the landscape so that poachers know that they're there and are less likely to try and come onto the land and poach wildlife. And they're doing an incredible job with it. Um, this is me, you have proof that I was there <laughs> with some of the women that I spent a lot of time with. Um, this is a photo when we're walking along doing a border, a fence patrol, uh, an early morning into late afternoon. Um, I also spent time, um, this photo with the truck in it is actually at the start of a night patrol where we're out there, you know, keeping an eye out for poaching or any uh, any potential break uh, breaks uh, breaches in the in the fence line at night, and this is what that looked like. At times, we would get out of the vehicle and go and uh, track spore um, and see, you know, if that was actually a threat to the to the reserve that we were on. Um, so I really was getting a taste of what it was like for the day to day. Uh, you know, work that these anti-poaching unit members were doing. But next, I got to see a group that was called Canine Conservation, uh, which really had a focus on using dogs to uh, track poachers. And um, that was just probably one of my favorite moments because I was surrounded by dogs at all times. They would use uh, Belgian Malinois, Romariners, and different uh, different coon dogs to be able to um, train them for different purposes, whether it was as attack dogs or um, you know sniffing out rhinos and uh, potential poachers. Um, but this is one of the pups that in the background, Peter Wern, who's the man who runs the organization that I was with on Makalali, um, 
Uh, I just love this photo because just such a sweet, sweet face right there. But he does such an incredible job, you know, protecting wildlife. You would never really expect that from dogs, but it's amazing that we're able to, you know, use our furry friends to help save other wildlife at the same time. We went tracking uh, tracking rhinos in the morning. This is a guy using a tel uh, using telemetry to track the the rhino to see where it is on the property, so we could go check it out. We found him and we also found another uh, pair of white rhino who was a mother and a calf, which was really, really exciting. And I also spent time at a uh, rhino orphanage. So I knew that, you know, there's, that was another side of this story that was gonna be really hard to see. But, um, you know, when, when mother rhinos get poached for their, for their horn, um, oftentimes their babies, if they're not killed at the same time, are left without a mother. So there's a lot of organizations that are protecting and, and rearing those uh, orphaned rhino calves. Um, and I was fortunate enough to go to visit uh, Care for Wild Rhino Sanctuary and get to see what that part of that world was like. Um, and gosh, they were cute. And of course, you can't help but fall in love with um, you know, I was already in love with rhinos to begin with, but gosh, my heart just exploded when I was around these guys and also hearing their stories about how, you know, these poor rhinos have so many, they have post-traumatic stress. They're really dealing with um, a lot of emotional baggage from when they are they lost their mothers. And it's amazing to see an organization spending time making sure that they're going to grow up and be able to live a healthy life and ideally get re-released into the wild. Um, but my trip took a very different turn with the last anti-poaching unit that I was with called Nkwe Training Tactical Training Academy. I had a chance to actually train with these guys, which was pretty intense. Um, and I really got a firsthand experience of what uh, what it's like to be uh, a part of an anti-poaching unit. I went on a deployment with them um, and really got to see uh, just another, another way that these guys go through training and just how much uh, effort gets put in. You know, they're putting me to the, to the test in this photo. I was, uh, doing push-ups alongside of them during their training. I spent time out on the range with them uh, because these guys, most anti-poaching units aside from the Black Mambas, which were all women that I spoke about, um, they have to be out there and armed um, in case anything happens, any alter, anything, any exchange between them and a poacher happens, they have to be ready. Um, I went out running through the African bush uh, after a tracking dog when they were doing an exercise on uh, tracking down a poacher and attacking that poacher to make sure that they could uh, get him for an arrest, which was really amazing. Also, I felt like my lungs were going to burst the whole time as I was trying to run and take photos. Um, and these are those same men, but in their day clothes as we're you know gearing up and getting all the things ready for their overnight deployment. Um, and also tracking white rhino on foot. We were this close to these two beautiful white rhino. And this was a really different experience from that first photo of white rhino or of a black rhino that I showed you. Cause here I'm on foot, right? And you realize how easy it is to get so close to these animals without them being afraid. And when I was in that moment, you know, sharing this beautiful moment with, a, with these two rhinos, able to hear them breathe every movement. I could hear when their skin rubbed together when they bumped into one another. But I also realized that as easy as it was for me to get that close to them, it also means it, that's how easy it is for a poacher to get that close to them. So I really felt in such a beautiful moment, I felt you know how awful and easy it is for people to get out there and, and harm this wildlife instead of feel that connection and love it. So um, back to Patagonia, this is where I was when I found out that I got my grant proposal accepted. This is me freaking out in the moment. You can see if you look really closely on my phone screen, it's my acceptance email from National Geographic saying that, uh, that I got my grant. And um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen or I'm going to uh, come back and look at you guys again. Um, 
There we go, am I back? And um, so with this, with that journey I had in South Africa the first time, trying to be an investigative journalist for the first time, figuring out what story I wanted to tell, I ended up realizing that we have this narrative in the United States that it's a war on poaching, it's a war against poachers, and that very easily can be seen as a war against poachers themselves. And we see poachers as the bad guy, when in reality, we should be looking at why poachers are poaching in the first place. You know, people, most people don't enjoy killing wildlife, and um, I knew there had to be a reason behind why people were doing this. And um, so in order to do that, I also learned one other thing when I was over there, and it's that 99% of poaching that happens is actually linked back to something that's called an inside job. So that means that you have people working on the land that rhino and elephant are on, and they might have jobs like they are anti-poaching unit rangers, or they work as safari guides, or you know they work for an eco lodge, but they have this connection to wildlife and they have this day job where they actually need that wildlife to survive. But they're being approached by poachers and being asked what the rhino location is in exchange for money. And because they need money that badly, they are saying, yes, I'll tell you, they're giving the information and they're helping poachers kill wildlife. And um, I saw that as an opportunity to cover the, the reason why people are poaching to begin with and maybe shed some light on um, what's called the socioeconomic drive of income potential. So people need money and they're turning to killing wildlife because that seems to be the only option they have. So I'm gonna be going uh, back to South Africa and investigating exactly that and trying to tell the stories of these local individuals and figure out if we can get people in the US, people around the world a little bit more tuned in into why people are poaching to begin with. And I think I went over time, so. <laughs> I'm gonna wrap it up there. <laughs> no, Terry, you did great um, on time and everything like that. Such a great story. Thank you so much for sharing, Tara. Um, it's just, it's so incredibly unique and a great example of what can happen with your life when you really follow your passion. And I, I loved how you ended that with um, saying how poachers aren't really the bad guys. Everyone's just trying to do what they think is right. So I think that's like a really good perspective on the crisis that's currently happening right now. Um, so that being said, we can start going to questions. We have around three joining us on YouTube. So everyone joining on YouTube, just know that I'm keeping an eye on the chat bar. And so if you have any questions, you can ask them there. Um, but we will start with Miss Miller's classroom. She came in a little bit later. Um, and so we're going to Miss Miller's classroom here. If you guys want to unmute your mic and ask Tara a question, you have the floor. <laughs> you guys have the mic muted on your end if you want to unmute that and ask the question. There you go. Too. Perfect. Which animals are poached most often and how can we do how can we do something to help them? That's a great question. Um, so I know I talked a lot mostly about rhino, but there's a lot of wildlife that's getting poached all over the world. The most trafficked so when I say trafficked, uh, I'm talking about illegal wildlife trafficking. There's a whole market for all sorts of illegal wildlife products. Um, and the most trafficked mammal at the moment is actually the pangolin. And I don't know if you guys know, what, do any of you know what a pangolin is? Yeah? <laughs> you can say it. I think he I knows what a pangolin is. So a pangolin is a type of, um, it looks almost like, um, a little like aardvark, but it looks, uh, it has armor like with scales. So what people want on the black market are the scales of this pangolin or the meat of the pangolin. And um, they're really plummeting towards extinction right now because of it. So they're the most trafficked mammal. The reason um, the, that rhino and elephants are really high up on that list right now is because ivory and also rhino horn are really, really expensive on the black market. So different uh, different groups of people see it as a status symbol um, to have that rhino horn in their house or that ivory carved into something. 
Um, and also for rhino horn in particular, it is the most expensive, it's the most valuable thing on the black market. Currently it's worth more in gold than anything else. Uh, so um, that's not helping the situation. So more and more rhino are being killed because it needs to fill the demand uh, in you know Southeast Asia for that product. So what can you guys do though? That's the important thing. Um, honestly, you guys are the next group of people who you guys are ambassadors for wildlife. If you have a love for wildlife, talk about it. If you know about something that's happening with the wildlife that you love, talk about that issue too. I think we sometimes shy away from things that are um, obviously sad. You know, the poaching crisis is not necessarily a fun topic to talk about, but if, if, if I was, you know, back at 10 years old, loving elephants as much as I did, at that time, I didn't know about the poaching crisis at all. And it wasn't as bad as it is now at that point. But if I were in your, if I picture myself in your shoes at, you know, 10, you know, or just starting middle school, I would have wanted to be able to learn about what's happening to that wildlife and be able to talk to people about that too, because you guys, you know, people can learn from you and, um, I think I think sometimes adults should be listening to kids a bit more when it comes to the things that they're passionate about. And if you guys can be a voice for the wildlife that you love or anything that you're caring about, you should, you should definitely, you know, be open to talk about it. You can make a difference for sure. Awesome. So we will head to the next question. We have Chelsea Skinner's class, Miss Skinner's class of grade four is coming from Texas. So you guys will have the floor now if you want to unmute your mic. How are you doing, Grape Force? Hi. Hi. Uh, with people poaching as an inside job, how do you help protect the animals? It's a good question. It's complicated too because, you know, I with inside jobs, usually there are people whose day jobs are to protect that wildlife. So I think um, when it comes to inside jobs, the the way that anti-poaching units are, are working on it, you know, they're trying to make sure that the individuals that are working for those anti-poaching units are uh, really banded together in a team. So it has, they, they have this mentality where they don't want to let the rest of the team down. So for example, that first anti-poaching unit I spent time with in South Africa, um, spent so much time. These guys went through really, really rigorous training um, to make sure not only that they were ready to be out in the African bush on their own, um, but they wanted that whole group of men to really be a team and have each other's backs. And they 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 told me that the reason behind that is so it's to minimize the, the chance that those individuals will essentially betray the trust of that organization and betray, you know, the mission of protecting that wildlife and um, that they won't be tempted by additional money uh, to kill that wildlife because they are so dedicated to the job that they're doing. And it seems that it's working, um, but it's also something that I'm going to be investigating a bit more. Uh, organizations down there are using something called a polygraph test, which is a lie detector test to make sure that employees are being honest uh, about their involvement with um, protecting wildlife instead of uh, helping poachers to find out where that wildlife is. Okay, so if anyone has any questions over the YouTube chat, just a reminder, I'm keeping an eye on that. We will move on to Kimberly, Miss Reed's classroom, and you guys will have the floor for any questions here. You can unmute your mic. <laughs> Why was a really clean lake called the Dirty Lake? Why was the really clean lake called the Dirty Lake? Um, so... <laughs> It was called Lago Sucio, I believe, because um, it's all glacial runoff. So when you look at the lake itself, because it has so many particles in it, I believe that's why it's able to reflect the light um, and the, the color of the sky so well. But it's actually full of a lot of sediment. So all, all of the water is trickling down through what looked like this really gravelly um, like hill, uh, hillside up to the mountain. And um, so it definitely is not crystal clear really 
you know, it is dirty water. It just doesn't look it because it's reflecting the light of the sun. Of it's reflecting the the blue of the sky so well that it just looks the complete opposite of of dirty. And I'm not I'm not a geologist, so I'm not sure if that's a hundred percent the reason why. Um, and I also don't know the history of the name, uh, so I wouldn't quote myself on exactly why it's called that. But uh, that's that was my take and what I understood from the guide that we were with. <laughs> I think we can all appreciate the irony. What you I think we can all appreciate the irony, though, of a beautiful. Yeah, lake. exactly. It was so gorgeous. I actually exclaimed out loud when I saw that. I was I wasn't with anyone. I walked all the way down, and I out loud was like, "Is this real? Like, how is this real?" Oh, so stunning. So we'll move on to the next questions. Um, we have Miss Tarvin's class coming from Illinois, a group of grade six. If you guys want to ha um, unmute your mic from the darkness, there you have a you have the last question. Oops, sorry. <laughs> uh, can you hear us? A little bit. Okay, okay, hear you, all right? <laughs> We're having uh, a lot of audio def uh, difficulties, so I apologize. <laughs> now our thing has gone up. Go ahead and ask. The, the girls wanted to know what consequences there were for poaching. If somebody gets caught poaching, are there specific consequences? Yeah, so that's a great question. And as with everything that comes with poaching, it's a complicated answer. Um, in South Africa, particularly, but throughout Africa, wherever poaching happens, you know, there's a big problem when it comes to corruption. So. There might be laws in place, but they're not necessarily being enforced. And um, what's happening in South Africa especially is that all these police stations basically run with paper dockets. So any crimes that come through are actually not tracked in a legitimate system. They're tracked on paper. At least that's what I learned when I was down there, which was kind of shocking. And um, and so these these poachers ideally are getting caught before they've killed any wildlife to begin with. But if you catch a poacher before they've poached, you only have a few options on what to arrest them for. And most often they're getting arrested for possession of a firearm that's not theirs. Um, but there's really not, uh, there's not a lot of enforcement behind that. Uh, they'll, they might get like sentenced to time in prison, but a lot of times these guys are getting out on bail um, and just leaving. And most most of the guys that are poaching in, in the parks in South Africa are actually coming over the border from Mozambique. Um, and they can just pass into Kruger National Park. And so if they do get out, they just go back. And a lot of times these anti-poaching units are catching the same guys over and over. Um, which is a bit disheartening to hear, but uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of work going on to to improve the enforcement side of things, so that you know when laws are in place, they actually get followed through on. Um, so there is hope. It's not it's not a doom and gloom situation, but um, there's a huge effort going on to kind of figure out how to make the enforcement side of those things a bit more of a reality right now. It's a great question. Yeah. So it looks like we got through everybody's classes um, for questions and everything like that. We have a little bit more time. So I'll go through each classroom one more time. We haven't had any questions on YouTube yet. Um, so if anybody has some more questions, we'll go to Mrs. Miller's classroom, her grade fives in Brampton. If you guys want to ask another question, you are able to do so. Sharvina, you know, you said it. Are you saying? Oops, sorry, you froze for a second. Can you repeat your question? Is poaching increasing or decreasing? Um, yeah, <laughs> that is, in general, I guess it's it's difficult to answer that question as an increase or decrease because it depends on where the poaching is happening. Um, it depends on the species. In South Africa, um, generally, it's on an increase. Uh, in places like Botswana, it's on a decrease, uh, and that's constantly changing. Um, but the the crisis itself is still a huge issue, um, regardless of if it's uh, how how much it's increasing or decreasing in a specific place. Um, 
we are seeing demand for rhino horn increasing currently. And so um, more than ever, the work that these anti-poaching units have to do is, uh, is, is really, you know, really, really important. But also the work that we have to do in the US, you know, we all travel to Africa. So many people have this dream of traveling to Africa and seeing this wildlife in person. But most people that go there really don't dig any deeper to understand what's actually happening to the wildlife that they're going there to see. And so it's our job, you know, in the United States, especially, I think, to really make sure that we're understanding not just how amazing and beautiful these creatures are, but if we really care about them, we need to dig a little deeper and take the time to understand what is going on with them on the ground, what's what they're facing that's leading towards their, their extinction, and also make the effort to understand how those local communities that live alongside that wildlife are also interacting with that wildlife and potentially able to help or harm the situation. So we need to have a better like understanding of everything that's happening. Um, so I'm hoping you guys leave with that message today that you should dig a little deeper and, and really figure out you know, what, the, what these things are facing um, in many, many different aspects of their, of their existence. Another great question. We got some. Great yeah, you guys are asking great questions. <laughs> I only um, hope I'm answering them well enough for you. No, you're doing great, Tara. Honestly, such a a great perspective on everything. So we'll head to Mrs. Skinner's classroom or grade fours in Austin, Texas. If you guys want to ask another question, hi, grade fours. Mm -hmm. um, you oh, have gosh. unmuted and are free to do so. Sophia. Because you are young, do you feel that people don't take you seriously? Wow, you guys, I love these questions. <laughs> um, you know, I did feel that way at one point. I found myself thinking, especially when I went to Africa on my own that first time, I when I was in the airport, especially right before I got there, I was like, oh my gosh, what have I done? Uh, I don't know what I'm getting myself into. You know, I, I've done all this preparation, but I've never done it before. Are they gonna take me seriously? On top of the fact that I'm young, um, I also am a, I'm a, I'm a woman, I'm a girl. And um, the, the field that I'm working in is, is a, lot of, a lot of guys. And um, I, for that same reason, was like, are they gonna take this 26 year old woman coming from the US seriously at all when I'm hanging out in the African bush with them doing their anti-poaching thing? Um, but I got over that really, really quickly. Um, and I think that even if people underestimate you because of your age or if you're a girl or because you don't seem to fit in, if you believe in yourself, even if they're underestimating you, you can use that to your advantage because you can surprise them with how, how well you perform and how you present yourself in those situations. So I felt like even though I went in there being intimidated by the fact that maybe people weren't going to take me seriously, I found there were that once I, once I overcame that idea and just you know was like, here I am, this is what I'm here for. For, I know I'm meant to be doing this. It was, um, you know, easier to push that aside and also use it to my advantage. You know, they don't think I'm going to do this incredible thing, but here I am. Let me surprise them and do it anyways. <laughs> Preach. I love that. That is a, a great perspective, especially for a lot of young women who are looking to get into something that may be a little bit more intimidating or out of their comfort zone or out for of sure. the um, So <laughs> great to encourage people to push their boundaries and to not let fear um, of being competent or fear of not being taken seriously hold you back. Um, so we have Miss Tarvin's class actually just heading out. Um, they have to disconnect, but they wanted to know if you would be able to say goodbye to them. Oh my gosh, of course. <laughs> well, I'm so glad you guys tuned in. I've had such an amazing time. So I hope you enjoy the rest of your day and learn something today. Oh, um, thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for joining today, guys. Hi, you guys can say bye. Hi, <laughs> <laughs> wow, there's so many of you. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's just all these voices coming from the yeah. darkness there. <laughs> okay, so we just went to Chelsea's class. We will go to Mrs. Reed's class or grade fives in Algonquin. Um, you guys have the floor here. Uh, unmute your mic and 
Tara can take your question. Nice enough. Um, what, where did the term poaching come from? Where does the poaching come from? Like, where is the term poaching? The term poaching, huh? Um, you know, I don't know the history behind the the actual word poaching, um, but it's just a more technical term than saying, you know, a legal killing of wildlife. Um, so I mean, we even have poaching in the United States. People don't really, most of the time when people think of the word poaching, they think of Africa, they think of rhino and elephants, but you can have something as simple as poaching, you know, um, a bear in Alaska that's not supposed to be killed on a certain, you know, in a certain national park and someone goes in and hunts it and, and kills it illegally. Um, so it's, it, it can be something much smaller. I mean, people can, even if they have a deer permit, but they kill the deer outside of the season, that's also considered poaching because it's the illegal killing of wildlife. Um, I don't know if that really answers your question. I don't have the technical uh, history of the word. I actually just did a quick Google search. <laughs> and <laughs> I love the internet. Um, and it's apparently um, from an old French origin of poche, which means bag or pocket. So it, kind of the translation is to enclose in a bag, which makes a little bit of sense, actually. Wow, look at you guys teaching me something today. <laughs> We're all learning together. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Awesome. So we're learning so many things today. Um, <laughs> we will head over to Miss um, Kirsten's classroom. I don't know if we've actually gotten to you guys yet. If you guys want to ask a question, you have the floor to do so. You just have to unmute your mic there. <laughs> <laughs> do, do, do. Yeah. <laughs> if you guys uh, are having issues with your mic, you can always ask a question through the chat okay. bar. I know we didn't have. Oh, there we go. Okay. Okay. Go. How have your campaigns worked? Like, have has your initiatives worked? Yes. Have have they been successful? Um, that's a great question. Uh, so I haven't gone and done my actual grant work with National Geographic Society yet. I'm planning to go this July. Um, so that actual story that I'm covering and the, the mapping that I'm going to be doing and the portrait series that I'll be doing for that piece, um, it's called In the Informant's Shoes. And it's going to be an article that is getting uh, kind of forcing readers to put themselves in the shoes of a potential informant or someone who would be approached by poachers, asked for uh, rhino location information in exchange for money. And the whole idea behind it is to have readers put themselves in that in the shoes of one of those individuals and ask themselves the same difficult question: What would I do? Would I would I inform the poaching syndicates? Um, so I haven't finished any of that yet. I haven't done the field work yet even, but I'll be going for 40 days in July. Um, so the only successes I have seen thus far is the fact that I uh, now have the support from National Geographic to go back and really do justice to this story that I just only started, you know, unsurfacing, you know, details about when I was in Africa this last time in January. Um, so I wish I had more to tell you, but hopefully the next time I do one of these things, I'll have a much better report on the success of that. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you so much for sharing your story today, Tara. Yeah. Um, so we're running close on time. So we're going to end the broadcast. But if everybody wants to unmute their mic and give Tara a big, <laughs> warm thank you um, for sharing with us today, you guys are free to do so. Thank you so much. Thank you guys for joining. <laughs> Thank you guys. I had an amazing time. I hope you all learned something. <laughs> It was so lovely. We had um, over 200 students join us from across the states and Canada today. So thank you for contributing to another great Exploring by the City Your Pants hangout. Um, yes, thank you, Tara. So I will be ending the broadcast.